Hi, I'm Brad Witt, and this is Woodhaven. Contrary to popular belief, you're now in Iowa and not heaven, although it's easy to confuse the two. We've got a great show planned for you today, so let's go inside and get started. Before we get started, I've got a pop quiz for you. Now don't worry, I won't make you quit watching this video if you get it wrong. Here goes. Which do you think is the most unutilized tool in the average woodworker's shop? Well, if your shop's like mine, you're probably thinking it's your dustpan and broom, or any of your cleanup tools. But that's not the answer I'm looking for. If you answered this tool, then you got it right. Now, I'm not implying you should use your head as a hammer, or as any other tool for that matter. What I'm talking about is keeping your mind sharp and focused on the task at hand. Always wearing your safety glasses and following common sense safety procedures are a start. The tools and techniques demonstrated in this video are my personal choices. Except for proprietary items, the tools are generic. The techniques I use should be adapted to suit your equipment and abilities. For more information about any of the tools or techniques used in this demonstration, you may contact us at the address shown at the end of this video. This video is going to cover all aspects of making frame and panels, with emphasis on raised panel and cope and pattern work. We'll take you from the design stage through the stock preparation process cutting the copes, pattern, and raised panels, and finally, assembly and finishing. First, let's define what we'll be talking about. This is the frame, and this is the panel. The frame is further broken down into two parts, rails and styles. Now let's cover some basic layout rules when designing a frame and panel. First, all styles run vertically. All rails run horizontally. You start by drawing your styles first the full length of your frame. This hides the end grain of the rail. Frame material width is usually two to two and a half inches. Try to keep a standard width stock for each individual project. Doors or panels over 24 inches wide are usually split in two. This is due to problems with expansion and contraction, and we'll cover more on this later. Frames may be as long as necessary, but I try not to exceed a one to 1.5 panel width to length ratio. Example, a 24 inch wide panel would not exceed 36 inches in length. Now remember, these are guidelines only. Next, see how the frame width you selected affects the overall appearance of your project by doing a scale drawing. You may wish to adjust the width of your intermediate rails and styles. Your styles on side frames will also need to be reduced by the thickness of the face panel or frame. You'll also need to increase the width of your bottom rail and the length of your styles to compensate for any base piece. If your project calls for a cathedral, arched, or eyebrow rail, you usually design its narrowest portion to be the same width as your other rail and style stock. The widest portion of all these pieces should also be the same as one another. In other words, the rise in all the pieces will be the same. Just the length of the pieces will vary. Now you're ready for the last step of the design phase. Make a detailed parts list and add an additional 25 to 30 percent for waste. Next, we're ready to begin the stock preparation phase for our rails and styles. For rail and style stock, I like to start with rough sawn lumber. This gives me enough thickness so I can face joint my boards to get them as flat and straight as possible. If this isn't an option for you, try to pick out the flattest and straightest stock possible. Sometimes I'll get my stock skip plane to 15 sixteenths of an inch. This is a hit or miss planing that lets you see some of the grain without wasting any more of its thickness than necessary. Now you want to cross cut your boards to an easily handled length. Use your material list to help determine the best length. First edge joint your board if necessary and then rip it approximately one eighth inch oversize as we've done here. Next, you'll need to edge joint and face joint your board. Now, first, we'll show you the face jointing operation. Remember to put your safety glasses on before using any power tools in your shop.
Now you need to thickness plane your boards to thickness and width. If you don't have a thickness planer, you can join your boards to width on your router table, which we'll show you in a minute. To perform the joining operation on your router, you need two essential items. One is a spiral cutter in your router table. This works the best and cuts the cleanest. And two is some sort of offset fence that's attached to your router fence. In this case, we've got an offset on this wooden fence face. And if you can see right in there, we're offset about 1 16th of an inch. Our outfeed side of this fence is set even with the cutting edge of our blade. And all we have to do now is run our workpiece along the cutter and we'll remove a sixteenth of an inch per pass. I like my rail and style stock to be at least thirteen sixteenths of an inch thick. This gives me a 50% thicker and 50% stronger back tongue than a 3 quarter inch thick piece of stock would give me. If you have arched rails, rough them out approximately 1 half to 1 inch over in length. Now lay out your pattern and bandsaw and drum sand to size, or use this template for template pattern routing to size. Rail and style bits cut the cope and pattern profiles necessary to assemble the rail and style framework. The cope cut is the male cut that interlocks on the pattern cut and is made in the end grain. The pattern cut is the female cut made in one or both edges of your rails and styles. 
You have three styles of rail and style cutters to choose from. A reversible set, a stack set, and a two-piece set. They all have some pros and cons. Stacked and two-piece sets can cost one and a half to two times as much as a reversible set. Stack sets are actually a reversible set with a longer arbor and an extra profile cutter thrown in. It's easy to change from cutting your pattern to cutting your coat. You simply lower your router. I don't care for this style because while you're cutting your pattern, that extra profile cutter is spinning over the top side of your workpiece. That's inviting trouble. However, with the proper hold downs, it could be used safely. Two-piece sets may require that you have a template for each size of arched rail you have to cut a pattern in. This is because on some sets, the bearing is way above the cutter. This eliminates using the rail piece for the bearing to write on and requires a separate template be made for this purpose instead. The nice part of these is that you eliminate the hassles of spacers and shim washers used on the reversible sets. As you may have guessed by now, my favorite rail and style cutter is a reversible style. It'll follow arched rails without needing a separate template, and it's one half the price of some two-piece style bits. It's also a little more intimidating because you have to actually take it apart and reassemble it, but you'll see you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. Before we actually make a cope or a pattern cut, we have to decide which cut we should make first. If you make your cope cuts first, you reduce your risk of blowout on the edge grain because you'll be cutting a profile on at least one of those edges later. The downside is, is that you first have to cut the piece to length, and this may leave you with a short and hard to hold piece to cut your pattern in. I prefer making the pattern cut in as long a piece as I can easily handle. Now I can put the molded stock in the bank and make withdrawals as necessary. All that's left to do is cut the stock to the required length and then make the cope cut. I can eliminate any tear out on my pattern edge by using a mated backer board. Let's go to the router table. Most cope and pattern cutters are designed for a 3 8 inch back set as measured off the face of your stock. We've installed our bit and we'll begin by making our pattern cut first and adjusting our bit to a 3 8 inch back set. We can do this with either a ruler or a previously cut piece of stock. Adjust the bearing on the bit even with or a little in front of the fence face to ensure you cut its full profile. Use your dust collector and hold downs to make the process safer. Now you're ready to make your pattern cut. When cutting the pattern on an arched rail like this, you'll need to use a starting pin instead of the fence on your router table. After making the pattern cut in the edge of our stock, we're ready to cut our stock to length. The style should be cut approximately one half inch longer than your required finish length. You'll trim these later. The rail pieces need to be cut the exact length. To measure the finish length of your rail, you'll need two short scraps of style stock, a tape measure, and your frame's finish width dimension. Hold your two style scraps back to back and lay your tape measure over them. Align the finished frame dimension mark, let's say 16 inches, with the break line 
This is the point where the pattern cut meets the flat face of the frame. Now read your tape at the other brake line. This is the finish length you need to cut your rail pieces. This dimension will always be less than your finished frame dimension. If it isn't, you better go back and remeasure. Remember, measure twice and cut once. Now we need to make our cope cuts in the end of our boards. First, we'll need to change our cutters around. Try it first without the shims and then add shims as necessary. Most cutters come with a very good instruction sheet covering this setup. Next adjust the bit height and make a test cut in a scrap piece. After you're satisfied with your fit, and here's a good fit, not too tight, you're ready for the next step. Using a scrap piece of stock, make a cope cut along one entire edge. Now you have a mating backer board to use when cutting the copes. The only other tool needed is a push block. I find this is easier to set up than a miter gauge as it's always square to the fence. I'm indexing off the fence and not a groove in the table. The fence should be set up in line with the bearing on the bit. Now I'll show you making a cope cut with our pattern piece attached to our mating piece and a push block. Then we'll remove this and show you how to flip the piece around and just using our push block cut the cope on the opposite end. For an arched rail, you'll need to go with a backer board that's long enough to contact the rail from point to point. Then cut it just like we did before. After all this, you should be able to cope with just about anything. The next step is to dry fit your frame and mark some index lines on the styles. If everything's cut right, this will go together real well for you. In this case, I want my finished door length to be 14 and a quarter inches. So I'll just bump this style together a little bit here until I get the measurement I want, making sure I have a little overhang over each end. All I have to do is make a little indexing mark. We'll use this for gluing up later. Now we'll transfer this to our next board. Using a good square, we'll keep these marks on both styles. and We can use these to ensure that we get good parallel. And there's our index lines for gluing later. Many separate issues must be addressed before laying out the size of your panels. Let's take them one at a time. Will your panels be made of solid wood, plywood, or glass? Glass and plywood panels are dimensionally stable, so you shouldn't have to be overly concerned with expansion or contraction. This makes layout very straightforward. I like to cut my plywood panels 1 8 inch undersize on both the length and the width of the panel. This allows for slight adjustments during assembly of a sixteenth along each edge. Although glass panels aren't going to move within the frame, I like to allow up to an eighth inch gap between the glass edge and the wood frame. Glass panels are very hard to trim to fit in tight openings. 
forcing an oversized glass panel can result in another trip to the glass store or to the hospital for stitches or both. This scenario can be avoided by allowing an 8 inch clearance I mentioned earlier. Installing the glass will be discussed later in the video. Solid wood panels require much more advanced planning before beginning work in the shop. Assuming that you are working with wood dried to a moisture content of 5 to 7 percent, you can expect up to an eighth inch of expansion per foot across the grain. By comparison, with the grain expansion is approximately one eighth inch per eight feet and is not a factor for most panel applications. Do you live in a warm, dry climate or one with high humidity and wide temperature variations? If you live in the southwest, for example, you shouldn't experience as much wood movement as a woodworker in the northeast. Are you building your project in the summer or the winter? This isn't as important a question for the southwestern woodworkers as those in the northeast. A woodworker in Vermont that builds a very tight raised panel door in the winter may find that same door swollen and cracked in the following summer. Another consideration would be if you are building a piece in Arizona that will have its home in Minnesota. Okay, no more examples. I'm sure you're following my drift. Here in the Midwest, we can experience a wide range of both temperature and humidity. In laying out my raised panels, I subtract 1 8 inch from panel width for every 12 inches, plus an additional 8 inch across the grain for insurance. Since movement is minimal with the grain, 1 8 inch total should be sufficient top to bottom. Try to remember this basic rule of thumb. The higher the humidity, the tighter you fit the panel. The lower the humidity, the looser you fit the panel. As I've said earlier, remember that these are just guidelines. Adjust this information to fit your locale. Now to the practical part. How do I figure the rough size of the panel so that I can then determine a finish size? The width of the panel is easy. Just measure the total length of the rail once the cope cuts are made. Figuring the length of the panel is done the same way as we figured our rail length earlier. Butt the two rails back to back and hold your tape with the finished dimension on one brake line while you read the opposite dimension on the other brake line. When measuring an arched rail, make sure you measure it at the narrowest point. From these two dimensions, you will subtract the necessary amount for expansion. You may be wondering if you can use the same curved template on the arch panel that you used to make the arched rail. I'm sorry to say that you can't. You're going to have to make a new template. Your panel top will follow the curve of the pattern at the brake line. You can either make a new paper template to match the curve of the rail or alter the first template to fit. There are three types of raised panels I'd like to show you that differ because of the amount that they project. The projecting panel is one that extends out past the face of the frame. This raised panel is typically made from three quarter inch thick stock, which gives it a projection of approximately one eighth of an inch. The flush panel is one whose face is in the same plane as the frame. You measure from the face of the style to the back of the groove, usually 5 eighths of an inch, and plane your stock to that thickness. A recessed raised panel is one whose face is below the plane of the frame face, but still raised in relationship to the groove in the rail and style stock. You may use 3 eighths to half inch thick stock for this, or thicker stock with a back cut. Then, of course, there's a flat plywood panel with no projection. The back of most panels are normally flat, extending directly into the panel groove in the frame. If you can't or don't want to plane your panel stock to the correct thickness to control its projection, you may elect to back cut the panel. This may be done with a router or any number of cutters. You have a choice as to the amount of reveal you'd like on your panel's edge. This can range anywhere from an inch and a half to a half inch, depending on the type and diameter of bit that you choose. The standard reveal for 5 8 to 3 quarter inch thick panels is inch and a half. This is also the standard for most kitchen cabinets. It's advantageous to use a bit designed for raised panels versus a straight cutter or a table saw blade set at a slight angle. The difference is apparent when you consider how the fit will change with wood movement. Here we have a raised panel cut at a slight bevel. Notice how this forms a wedge in the groove where it fits. It could expand to the point where it's too tight and causes damage, or it may shrink, exposing an ugly gap. Notice how a panel cut with a bit designed for raised panels has a flat tongue instead of a wedge-shaped one. 
This allows expansion or contraction of the panel without any dramatic change in fit or appearance. We have two styles of raised panel bits to choose from, horizontal and vertical. Horizontal bits to cut a one and one half inch reveal must be three and three eighths inch in diameter or larger. A bit this large requires a variable speed two and a quarter horsepower or larger router and should never be run at full speed. Ideally you'll run it at eight to ten thousand RPM. A horizontal bit is mandatory if you're going to cut arched or eyebrow type raised panels. A vertical bit can cut a panel with a one and one half inch reveal without a variable speed or large horsepower router. That's because the diameter of the bit is only one inch versus three and three eighths inch or more. A vertical bit will not cut an arched or eyebrow type raised panel. This is because the panel edge must ride on the router table top. The reduced diameter of the vertical bit is safer and allows greater control when feeding the panel. No matter which bit you choose, never make the panel in one or two passes. Always plan on making three to five passes to reduce the stress on the router, the bit, the workpiece, and yourself. Normally, you'll keep cutting the panel until you get to slightly under a quarter inch tongue thickness. You want a tongue that will slide easily in a groove made by your pattern cutter without too much slop. Make successive cuts on all your panels instead of completing each panel individually. To use a horizontal bit, you need to be able to lower the bit below the router table and gradually raise it, exposing more workpiece to the bit with each adjustment. This requires that you have a router plate mounted to your router with a bit hole large enough to accommodate the diameter of bit you are using. While that's one option, you may not be thrilled with the fact that the cutter is spinning so close to your router's metal base. I know of a fellow who was cutting his panels this way when all of a sudden his plunge lock released. The bit tried to cut its way down through the metal base, destroying both the router base and the bit. That's more fun than one person should be allowed to have in one day. An alternative would be to raise the table around the bit. This is accomplished with a simple subtable, one quarter to three eighths of an inch thick. Clamp the subtable in place and install a guard. You'll notice we have a starting pin. This is mandatory. This is so that we can gradually pivot our workpiece off of it and into the cutter. This pin should be as close as safely possible to the bit. Notice how our bit is spinning just above the plastic plate. If it happens to drop, it will more than likely destroy the plate, but that's all, so it's a nice buffer. Our fence is also set back quite a ways from our bit to accommodate the curve of our arched panel. The pin and fence setback wouldn't be necessary if our panel had straight edges only. With this method, you'll need to be sure you have a safe amount, minimum three quarters of an inch, of your bit shank in the router. You'll also need to be sure that you have sufficient bit height adjustment. Here's how you cut an arch type panel with a horizontal bit.
Well, that came out pretty nice. I think we'll keep that. As I said earlier, the vertical bit is a little less intimidating because of its smaller size. I usually set it to its full cut height right here on the table and then make any depth adjustments using my fence. I'll use a piece of tape on my table and mark my fence setting for each successive cut. If I'm using a fingerboard as we are here, I'll make a gauge block to facilitate adjusting it each time I move the fence. You'll also notice I have an 8-inch high auxiliary fence attached to my regular router fence. This adds stability to the panel as I feed it. Now another point I forgot to mention earlier is that with the vertical bit you can cut much smaller panels than you can with a horizontal bit. In this case this one's only 6 inches square and it's very easily done with a setup like this. As with all large bits like this, make your cuts gradually, keeping a firm grip on the panel. Use push blocks, hold downs, and a guard if possible. I'll make three to four heavy passes, getting closer and closer to the quarter inch tongue thickness I need. Then I'll make a light finish pass to clean up any burning, irregularities, etc. Boy, that's a good fit. That's just what we're looking for. Before you rush headlong into assembling the panel into the frame, there's two things you have to do. First, you need to sand it, especially the contours cut by the raised panel bit. Next, you need to apply a coat of stain, if desired, or one coat of clear finish. Then, after assembly, you don't have to worry about the panel shrinking and revealing an unfinished edge. Well, those look pretty nice. I think we're done with those for now. All right, we're almost there. There's one more item to consider before assembly. Do you want or need to increase the strength of your Copeland pattern joint by adding a screw, which we have pictured here, or a dowel? Heavy doors or doors you plan to hang a lot of tools on may be candidates for this. Doweling will require a doweling jig and will result in a hidden joint. Screws must be installed from the edge of the style. If you intend to route the outside of your frame and panel, you'll need to countersink the head of the screw enough so the router bit will not strike it. You'll also need to plug the screw hole after assembly. And then we take our screwdriver and assemble the joint. Now we'll cut a sample dowel joint to show you how it's done. Have your pieces marked off with your index lines. And use a simple dowel jig like this. Now with a jig like this, a lot of people use a brad point bit, but I don't. I find what happens is if I slightly wobble a bit in that dowel jig at all, I'll take the little tips off the end of my brad point. So I just use a regular bit doesn't matter how clean the hole is or how clean the edge of the hole is in this because it's completely hidden anyway.
We'll put our workpiece in the jig and center it on our index marks, and then clamp it all on the vise. We've got a simple depth gauge here. Just drill down to our tape. That's half our joint right there. Now repeat the same procedure on the mating piece. Now you're ready to glue up your frame and panel. Lay out two styles, two rails, and one panel, and dry fit everything. Brush glue onto the copes. Then assemble the frame and panel using your index line on the styles as guides. Clamp your frame up and then check for square. After drying you can clip the excess off your style ends on the table saw. If you're unsure that you'll be able to glue your panel up perfectly, and this can be challenging, then spread your index lines apart another sixteenth of an inch. Clamp and glue to these just like before. Now instead of clipping off just the ends of your styles in the table saw, you'll actually cross cut approximately one thirty second of an inch off the entire edge. <laughs> Now we'll cross cut our entire panel's opposite edge using our rip fence as a guide. We're going to take a little bit off this entire edge length. <laughs> Now you have a frame of floating panel assembly. If your panel rattles or you want to center your panel in the frame to reduce excessive amounts of movement from one side to the other, you'll need to pin it. Center your panel in the frame and drill two pilot holes only through the back tongue and into the two end grain tongues of your panel. Use a small brad or a wooden peg to pin the panel in place. I like a special nail that's designed just for nailing through thin pieces that have a tendency to split. It's called a Wonder Brad and it doesn't require any pilot hole because it's so thin and sharp. You drive it into the desired depth and then strike it sideways. Be sure you're wearing your safety glasses. It breaks off just below the surface, so you don't even need to use a nail set. It doesn't get much better than that. Now I'll show you how to drill for the pig. And that's how you do a pig. Okay, just a couple things left. After you've assembled your frame, more than likely you're going to have some slight variations in the elevation here where your cope joins the pattern. Don't worry about it. You're never going to get that bit set up to cut it absolutely perfect. Take a finished sander or one of the new random orbit sanders and it'll take that right down. After that, all that's left to do is to route the outside perimeter 
and possibly even rabbit the backside. That's up to you. If you're building a frame for a glass panel, then assemble the frame without the glass. After it's dried, remove the back tongue with a rabbiting bit and chisel to square the corners. They do make some special coping pattern cutters just for this purpose, but the method I outline works just as well. You can use some silicone in spots around the perimeter of your glass to hold it in place and prevent it from rattling. Well, we hope you enjoyed this. We've put as much information in it as we possibly thought you could use. If you've got any questions about this or anything else, please call us at the number at the end of the video. Now the tools and techniques demonstrated in this video are my personal choices. Except for protect, for, duh, not. Or use your pattern as a template and template pattern out. Template pattern route. Here's how you cut an arch type panel with a horizontal bit. <laughs> 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 you can still play. What? <laughs> 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 <laughs>